Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. God is good. Thank God I have another opportunity to be able to stand and share his word. Another Bible study night. You know, unfortunately, it's not a time where we could gather together, but it is a time where God's word can still continue to go forth. And so I thank God for the opportunity to be able to do so. God is good. Uh, my lesson tonight title is, It's Not One and Done. And one might ask, what do you mean when you say one and done? I'm talking, even when we look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 26, it says Jesus' three prayers. Jesus thought that it was necessary to pray more than one time. I think with us, a lot of times we think that if we say it, that's it. It is one and done. And I tell you, the situation that we're living in right now, the time that we're in right now, it can't be one and done with our prayers. We have got to seek God. We have got to change our ways. We have got to recognize that there's times that we have got to just continue to come before Almighty God and seek his face and seek his favor. The scripture says the prayers of the righteous availeth much. I want to open in prayer, if I may. Fathers, in the most precious name of Jesus, that we come. We come to say thank you. We thank you for yet another opportunity, another privilege to be able to share your word. We thank you in advance for the impact your word is going to have in and on the lives of your people. We're thanking you right now for deliverance. We're thanking you for healing. We're thanking you for peace. Father, you said in your word, you grant peace to those whose mind is stayed on you. You say you would keep us in a perfect peace. And Father, with all that's going on today, we need your peace. And for that, we want to say thank you. We love you. We bless you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse number 36. The word of God reads, it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And again, as I look at this particular account, it's Jesus' three prayers. And when we begin, it talks about Jesus. It says, he came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with them Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And when I looked at this, if Jesus had taken, and it was Peter, James, and John, this was actually, in the scripture, a third account of when he actually brought those three uh, with him together. I would call them the innermost circle. You know, we can have a circle, we can, we can have an outer circle, we can have a, a circle, but these three was in his innermost circle, and he called them to be with him. Now, the other eight, because he started out with 12, but Judas is now gone. So that means there's eight that's sitting there waiting, and he has the other three with him. And so when we look at the scripture here, 
he, he asked them to go with him. And he said that he began to be sorrowful and, and, and deeply distressed. And when you think about that, he was in agony. He was thinking about what it was that he had to face with the cross. And you know, as I was thinking about that, it wasn't so much that Jesus was, I, I believe, really concerned about the pain. And although that would have been horrible, although knowing that it would be death of a cross, an embarrassing way to die, being naked on a cross, being beaten, being spit upon. But I believe the agony came from him knowing that he was going to be separated from Almighty God because at this particular time, he was taking on the entire sins of the world. And so when we go on and he says, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. This was a request that Jesus was making to the father. In other words, he's saying, father, let this cup pass from me. And then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And I believe for us a lot of times, even as God is speaking to us, as God is ministering to us, there's times when God will say, do this, God will say, do that. And we're like, but Lord, do I really have to? Lord, I'm, I, it just don't make me feel comfortable. Lord, I'm not sure if I want to. And really, when it's all said and done, if you're not following what the Spirit of God is saying to you, it's really an act of disobedience. And here Jesus is saying, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We go on to verse number 40. He says, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what? Now imagine this. Now he asked them to come and, and be with me while I'm praying. And, and, and he said to Peter, he's like, Peter, what, what's going on? Now this was directed to all three, but he was talking to Peter. And when you think about it, Peter had very early on, he had said that I'll never leave you, Lord. I'll never forsake you, Lord. Lord, I'll even die for you. And here he is right now where Jesus needed him the most, the hour of agony, the hour that Jesus was faced with. And Peter and the other disciples were not even able to stay woke with him at this particular time. And I, I said that because when you look at this, even in our walk of life, there's so many different things going on and we're going to take a nap. We're going to take a break. We're going to take time off. We're going to take time out. We cannot afford to take time out. We cannot afford to take time off. We need to be on point. We need to be prayerfully uh, considering everything that's going on in this walk of life. And I'll go on. He said, could you not watch with me one hour? In other words, what Jesus has said is, look, I'm not asking you to, to do an all-night prayer service, but what I'm asking you to do is take some time out. You know, a lot of times when we start talking about praying, the first thing that happens, if you ever want to pray and you go and get down on your knees and, and the first thing that happens as soon as you get down on your knees, you, you begin to get all kinds of thoughts come through your mind. You begin to, to feel tired and, and, and then you just like, well, what in the world is going on? And this was the way it was with the disciples because they should have had a focus on locking faith with Jesus, just like the saints of God. We need to lock faith so we can get this thing out of our nation. We can get this thing out of the world. When we come together as one mind, one body, one spirit and be in prayer, I believe that we can make some differences and we can change some things. Praise God. And you go on. He says, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now here, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, when you look at this, he said, watch. In other words, Stay woke. Don't go to sleep. Stay woke. Uh, be on point. And, and he says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation as well. And what they did not understand is they should have been in prayer because with what was getting ready to take place with Jesus getting ready to be arrested and taken away from them, they were going to be tempted beyond anything that they could have imagined. And prayer would have actually prepared them. 
It's like right now, some of the different things that's going on in this world, we just think about the virus, all those different things. I'm not saying that we were prepared at this type of magnitude for what's going on, but we could be prepared to the level to where we're not so fearful, to where we can say, Lord, in spite of what's going on, I know that you are still in control. Lord, in spite of what's going on, I know that this thing is going to eventually change. And Lord, if it don't change, you are still God all by yourself. Because, see, there's some people that's going to tell you, oh, you just hold on and this thing's going to change here in a little while. I can't tell you that. The one thing that I can tell you is that this has not taken God by surprise and we need not be surprised by it. But what we need to begin to do, though, is that's where we got to begin to figure out who we are in Christ. We've got to begin to figure out, are we really who we say that we are? Are we really ready to pray? Because I'll tell you something. If you can't pray during the good times, it's going to be very hard to pray during the hard times. And the reason I say that is because you develop a prayer life. You develop a time of communicating with God. And not only do you hear from God through your prayers, your prayer time is also an opportunity for God to speak back to you. And so when you go on, he says, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, when I think about that, he said, the spirit, in other words, hey, I'm ready to go. I'm going to do this thing. I'm all, I'm all with you, Jesus. I'm not going nowhere. I'm going to be a part of, of who you are. I'm going to be a part of this ministry. You know, folk tell you that. I'm going to be a part of the ministry. But then it goes on to say that the spirit, the spirit, you know, this inner person is it, ready to go. But then when you look at it, this old flesh is weak. And this flesh is weak to the point to where it actually requires prayer. In other words, Prayer empowers us. Prayer will give us a sense of confidence, a sense of, of, of well-being, a sense of knowing that, okay, God, you said it, and that's what I'm going to do. Lord, that's how you spoke to my spirit, and so I'm ready to go. And so when you look at this, he say, the spirit indeed is willing. Yes, I'm, I'm ready to go, but I'm not strong enough because my flesh can't handle this all by itself. It requires the spirit of the living God operating on the inside so I can get this thing done. I go on, I'm looking at verse number 42. He says, and again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, now it's a little bit different in this prayer. He says, oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Now, up there at verse number 39, he was making a request to have it removed if it was possible. Here he's saying, Father, if this cup cannot pass for me unless I drink it, your will be done. In other words, what Jesus has done is Jesus has made up in his mind through the prayer here that, Lord, okay, this is what I'm called to do because the scripture clearly says that he came on this earth to do the will of his Father. And when you look at this, Jesus is saying, okay, um, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And so what Jesus has begun to do is Jesus began to make peace with what he has to do. Now, there's still agony because he knows that once he takes the cup, and this is actually symbolic because it's a cup of wrath. And so when you think about this, it's all of God's wrath. All the sins of the entire world were scheduled to be placed on Jesus. And that's what Jesus was thinking about. I will be separated from almighty God. See, Jesus had never been separated from the Father, but taking on sin, the sin, the entire sins of the world, he would be separated from Almighty God. He says, and he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. You know, when you get to that point, you know, it's just, it's hard. You know, people talk about, put a toothpick in them and all that kind of stuff. It's hard. You just tired. No matter what you do, no matter what position you get in, as soon as you just, if you just stop for a moment, you go on to sleep. And this was the situation with the disciples. It says that their eyes were heavy. It says, so he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time saying the same words. And those same words were, oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And so when we look at this again, Jesus is saying, okay, I prayed the first time. I prayed the second time. 
I'm praying a third time. And the reason I want to put some emphasis on this is because for us with our prayer life, and I tell you, sometimes we have a tendency, and I don't know if we could call it maybe a sense of laziness or maybe it's a sense of sometimes maybe not even having enough confidence in your prayers to even believe that they're going to go above the ceiling. But what Jesus was doing here is I believe this is an example for us to follow, to recognize that when we are in dire straits, when we're uh, uh, sorrowful, when we got stressful things going on, and, you know, not just one time, but maybe two times, possibly three times, or whatever amount of time that you may think that it takes in order to get the peace. It's not that you're bagging God or anything like that. It's because of the relationship that you have with Almighty God. And I will say this to you. What better person to talk to two, three, four, five times than Almighty God? Because, see, you could go to a man, you could go to a woman, you could go to a boy, you could go to a girl, and you could talk to them two, three, four times, but they will never, ever be able to give you the peace that God's word can bring. And so that's why I believe, as we look at this example of Jesus' three prayers, I believe that's why we need to follow suit. And that's why I titled this message, Not One and Done. And so when you think about not being one and done, I'm not going to pray one time and just be done. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to continue to talk to God about the situation that's going on. For example, when we look at the virus, this virus is, is worldwide. This virus has, has turned this nation upside down. This virus has turned the economy upside down. The virus has turned our lives upside down. You know, some not working. Uh, children are not in school. Your, your home uh, has become an office. Your home has become a classroom. And so it's not what we used to deem normal. So now we have what we call a new normal. And when you look at this new normal, it's different. It's something that we're not used to. And so in order to begin to have some peace in this new normal, it's going to require prayer time. And that's why one time will not be enough because things are changing rapidly. Things are changing daily. Things are changing to such a degree. If you prayed on Monday and you left that prayer on Monday, what's going to happen with what's going on on Tuesday? Because see, Tuesday is a new day. They say, okay, on Monday, it was this number of people who were diagnosed. Or, you know, the test came back a positive. And now on Tuesday, we have another 40, 50. What is that going to do to your mind if you're only trying to rely on the prayer from Monday? I think about this. The scripture, the scripture talks about he grants us new mercies daily. He said it's because of those mercies that we're not consumed. And I believe consumed with grief, consumed with fear. And so if it's a new mercy daily, you say, great is thy faithfulness. It, new mercy. So in other words, what the scripture is saying to me that I believe is that the mercies of yesterday is not going to be enough to keep me for what's going on today. And so some might say, but God is able. Yes, God is able, but he says he grants new mercies daily. And so that means that each day when we get up, and that's why it's important to have a prayer life. That's why it's important to read the word of God. That's why it's so important on a regular to get up and be communicating with Almighty God. Because that peace that you got yesterday, that peace can't carry over to today. You need to go back and seek God today. And that prayer, you may do that, that pray that same prayer similar, maybe not word for word, but it's similar because of what you're expecting, because of what you're looking for. Praise God. It says, so he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same word. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, now here we go, listen to this. Are you still sleeping and resting? Sleeping and resting at a time like this, I'm not telling you that we're not supposed to, 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 you know, take our time and do some different things. But there's just certain situations that's going on around us right now. We can't take time off 
to go to sleep. We can't take time off to be resting. We've got to be in this thing. And that's why I say sometimes instead of being somewhere sleeping, and resting, maybe you should be on your face before Almighty God. Maybe turning out plates over. Maybe fasting. Because you know, even the scriptures say certain kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. And so when I think about that, you know, where are you with this? What's going on in your walk of life? What is it that you need to do? Because when he went to those disciples, he said, he came to he said, the disciples, he said, this is what he said, are you still sleeping? And resting. Try and imagine that. Here Jesus is. He asked them to go with him. His innermost circle. Come on. Peter, James, and John. The other eight he left there. And he took those three because those three, as I said early on in in, in the message, those three he had taken with him a couple other times and, and they were there to support him. They were there to encourage him. And uh, when I look at that, there was a time in Luke 8 when uh, they were there for the raising of Jairus' daughter. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 13, it was a transfiguration. And I believe when you look at his innermost circle, it was some things that he could trust them with that he probably could not trust others with. Now, people will tell you is that, oh, are you showing favoritism? And I don't believe that's favoritism. I believe that you should have an innermost circle because that innermost circle will be those that you know have your back, will be those that you know are right there with you. So I believe it's okay to have an innermost circle. And when I looked at this, even as Jesus Imagine if Jesus had taken all of them with doing the, let's say, just say the, the, the transfiguration and they would have saw Moses, they would saw Elijah, because I mean, those three, they wanted to build an altar as it was. So imagine if you had had all 12 of them there, there's no telling what they would have said, what they would have done, because Jesus even told them, Jesus says, tell this to no one until after the son of man has risen from the dead. Now, you got three, you can get three to maybe hold on to a secret, but I don't know, it might be pretty tough for 12 of them. And so that's why I believe Jesus also had his inner circle. And he actually the quote there, Jesus said, tell the vision to no one until the son of man is risen from the dead. And so as I look at this, I, I tell you, it's, it's just so good because when you think about Jesus and you know, uh, this past Sunday, it was our, our Palm Sunday. This was the Sunday that he actually rode in. This was the Sunday where he was prepared to publicly say, I am indeed the king. I am indeed Messiah. And now here we are, praise God, right here at the point to where he's being betrayed. Here we are at this point where he's getting prepared so that he can begin to take on the sins of the entire world. Here we are in a situation where he knows that once he goes, once he gathers up his disciples, what's going to happen is, is that he's going to go, he's going to be arrested just by a kiss, the kiss from Judas. We call it the kiss of death. He knew all these things. He knew all these things was going to happen to him. Yet, in spite of all of that, in spite of the pain, in spite of being spit upon, in spite of knowing that he would be separated from the Father, he still was ready to go. And I say that this commitment was not a, a wishy-washy commitment. This commitment was knowing the total cost for what was going to happen. And he did this for you. He did that for me. In other words, I think about the scripture says, yet while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ Jesus died for us. In other words, he didn't wait for us to change, to try and make a difference. He did it in spite of, and he demonstrated nothing except love. And so when I think about the time that we're living in right now, that's why uh, when I think about the scripture, the scriptures say that God is love 
He who knows God knows love. If you don't know love, you don't know God. And people get mad with you when you say things like that to them. Because the first thing they say is, I really don't have to know God to love. And the thing that I would say to you is, what type of love are you showing? What type of love is being displayed? And unfortunately, most of the love for us is, is a love where we can get together with one another, not a love where we can take care of each other. And so Jesus is talking about a love to take care of us, to take care of you, to take care of me. And so I go on again. He says, are you still sleeping and resting? He says, behold, the hour is at hand and the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. You know, sometimes people will say, well, did he not know what was going to happen to him? Did he not know that this was going to happen? Did he not? He knew exactly what was going to happen. And I believe as I go back and I want to look back when he when, when, when I looked at the verse of scripture in uh, 41, excuse me, it said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. When you look at right here, when he told his disciples, he says, behold, the hour is at hand. The son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. And when they began to look at that, imagine the fear Imagine how they felt. Now, they heard Jesus speak this. They actually had an opportunity to be in prayer so they could have been better prepared for what was about to take place. And when you think about it, when it did take place, it speaks about how they scattered. And I believe had they taken the time while Jesus was praying and they took the time to pray, they would have been better prepared for what was coming. And I say that because even right now, we don't know what's coming. We don't know where this thing is going. And I say this thing, we don't know where this virus is going. We don't know the impact that it will continue to have on our economy. We don't know the impact that it will continue to have on the lives of our people. We don't know the impact that it's going to have as a whole. And so what I'm trying to get you to understand is, is we have got to recognize that it's time to pray. We have got to make up our minds to get on our knees. If you can't get on your knees, stand before Almighty God, raise your hands and as a sign of submitting and cry out to God, cry out to God with a loud voice and ask God to, to hold back that virus, to, to still that virus, to, to get the economy back together, praise God. I will say this, though, is the reason why things are like they are is because of the hearts of man. Now, I believe that until we change our hearts, we change and actually enter into a personal, intimate relationship with Almighty God. I think this is going to be a struggle from now until even, even if we get through this, there's going to be something else that's going to come and it's going to continue to remind us that God is in control. And so I ask you this question, is he in control of your life? Is God actually in control of your life? Verse number 40, as I close with this particular verse, it says from this, this account, it says rise let us be going see my betrayer is at hand. And again, we know when we go back and we look at the scripture, when Jesus had said, when they were at the table, he said, one of you will betray me. And all of them begin to look around at each other and say, Lord, is it I? No, Lord, is it I? Is it I? And he said, once I dip the, dip, dip the bread and, and the one I give it to is the one that's going to betray me. And after that, Judas got up and Jesus told him to go and do what you're going to do. So he knew that Judas had and or will betray him. And so I just say that we've got to understand that prayer, and I want to read, I have a note here. It says, our flesh is human weakness. That means everyone, everyone says prayer is a supernatural empowerment that we need to make it day by day. And I said that because it's prayer that will strengthen you. It's prayer that will encourage you. 
It's prayer that will help you get up and be ready to do what God has called you to do. I want to read a couple of verses of scripture from Romans chapter 8. And when you look at the word of God, the word of God is just, just such, such power. And, and what I want to talk about very quickly is when we, I said our flesh is human weakness. And I want to talk about why it's so important to operate in the spirit. I'm going to read from Romans chapter 8. I'm going to begin at verse number 1. And the word of God reads, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, who is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now you can see why this flesh and it, it, even as we read back and said, this flesh is weak. That's why it requires the spirit of the living God to supernaturally empower us. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And I read that and I pray that a little bit later on in your quiet time, you go back and reflect on these various verses of scripture because again, we're talking about operating in the spirit versus the Flesh. And one thing that I can say that excites me is for every born again believer, every born again believer has the exact same spirit operating on the inside that raised Christ from the dead. And you say, what? How do you know that? I just read it. Romans 8 verse number 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you, who lives in you. And so I say this, don't let your prayers be one and done. Be sincere about your prayers. Be sincere in your relationship with Almighty God. And maybe you say, well, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I really don't have that type of relationship that you're talking about. Well, it's good that you say that because guess what? Today you can have that relationship. Today you can have this same spirit that raised Christ from the dead operating on the inside of you. And again, I say it's for every born again believer, that same spirit is operating in them. And so I say to you today, is there one today that want that same spirit operating on the inside of them. You can have that spirit. Just repeat this prayer with me. Father God, it's in the most precious name of your son, Jesus. I thank you for allowing me to come before you this day. Forgive me, Father. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my shortcomings. Jesus, come into my life. Live on the inside. Jesus, come in and allow me to grow in the grace, in the wisdom, in the knowledge, in the understanding of your word. Jesus, 
I thank you for coming in. Jesus, I thank you that now I have a personal, intimate relationship with Almighty God. Jesus, I thank you now because I have confessed with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you indeed died and raised from the dead. Jesus, I thank you for coming into my life. Father, I thank you for accepting me into your family. And for that, I want to say thank you. Amen. Amen. If you've done that, welcome to the family of God. And you know, you're probably saying, well, I don't feel that spirit. Where's that spirit? That spirit is there. And all you have to do now, begin to be obedient to that spirit. And so as I close out right now in prayer, I just want to say, God speed. And remember, your prayer should not be one and done. Father, we thank you for yet another privilege, another opportunity to share your word. Father, your word goes forth. Heal, deliver, and set free. Father, for that person, person that has accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, Father, begin to move in such a way that they would know beyond any doubt that it's not from a mere man, a woman, a boy, or girl, but straight from you. Father, we love you. We bless you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.